I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. As the future direction of the Supreme Court is debated, our guest this episode is Ilya Shapiro, director of the Cato Institute's Constitutional Studies Center. His timely new book is Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations and the Politics of America's Highest Court. When I was growing up, the first branch was very different than it is today. And that persisted, and we think back to 1993 when, when President Clinton nominated me with a good job I now hold. I had been general counsel to American Civil Liberties Union for several years. Mm -hmm. The vote was 96 to 3 in my favor. My biggest supporter on the Judiciary Committee was not the then chair, Senator Biden, Mm. although he was certainly in in my favor. But it was Orrin Hatch. Mm. I think today he wouldn't touch me with a 10-foot pole. (laughs) No, that isn't. That, that we have, we have, we are still friends. Yes. But if it if it came to a vote on me, I, I don't think he would be the supporter that he was in 1993. And it was similar for Stephen Breyer when he was nominated the next year. It was well into the 90s. A vote in his favor. It hasn't been that way for the four most recent mm. members of the court. And it's been on both sides of the aisle. Um, I wish there were a way I could wave a magic wand and put it back when people were respectful of each other and the Congress was working for the good of the country and not just along party lines. Someday there'll be great people great elected representatives who will say enough of this nonsense let's be the kind of legislature the United States should have I hope that day will come while I'm still alive Ilya Shapiro you've just uh, published a book on the court called Supreme Disorder Judicial Nominations and the Politics of America's Highest Court we just heard the late Justice Ginsburg hoping for a day when the Congress would uh, return to less partisan times in Supreme Court nominations youth call it uh, under the same toxic cloud that affects all of our public discourse how did we get to this point yeah, I mean, I, I share Justice Ginsburg's wish that we could uh, wave a magic wand and, and unwind it. Uh, it turns out, um, I, this is what I wanted to find out in, in writing the book, which I set out to do after the Kavanaugh process a couple of years ago. It turns out that politics has always been a part of the process of nominations and confirmations. Uh, George Washington had a nominee rejected. Uh, the early presidents always had to balance regional concerns. Then it became a matter of party factions, the issue of slavery, and on and on. Uh, different things uh, played a role. Where, why we are what we where we are now and what's new is that, first of all, you have uh, big centralized government in Washington over the course of decades. Power has been amassed and the Supreme Court has played a part in that. Uh, and then within Washington, within the federal government, a skew away from Congress, which doesn't resolve major issues or political controversies so much anymore, but punts them to the administrative agencies in the executive branch, which are then sued, and then that goes to the court as well. So you have that big, important decision-making process. And at the same time, culmination of several trends where different interpretive theories map onto partisan preferences at a time when the parties are more ideologically sorted than at least the Civil War, if not ever. And so, of course, there's going to be a fight every time there's a vacancy for one of these very powerful seats. One of the downsides of this is that every a, a public opinion poll about the court is that the public increasingly sees the court as a political institution. Is that the right way to look about it, at it? Are, are its members political or philosophically divided? Uh, yeah, philosophically or jurisprudentially, I, I think it's it's definitely unfortunate that that people see the court as liberals and conservatives, let alone Democrats and, and Republicans with a, with a partisan uh, vein. Um, but uh, that's the, the, the natural um, result of, of this dynamic where 
uh, if you have uh, if you're an originalist or a textualist if you view the law for uh, based on uh, the meaning of the words when they were enacted um, then you're probably going to be appointed by a republican president if you're more pragmatic or look at the purpose of the law or the meaning of the text might change over time to achieve uh, certain conceptions of justice, then chances are you've been appointed by a, a democratic president. And it's that ultimate divergence in, um, in different views, different methodologies, that's, that's what's causing that. Uh, and uh, you know, there are no more liberal Republicans or, or, or conservative Democrats. And so even though I make it clear, I try to make it clear in my book that I'm not saying the court is a political actor, and that's different than saying that the process of nominations and confirmations has been and has to be political given the nature of the dynamic. Um, I think it's it's unfortunate indeed that, that, that people see the court as just another political actor akin to Congress or, or the race for the White House. So before we dip in some of the history that you've written about, you are the lead constitutional scholar at the Cato Institute. For our, our viewers and listeners, would you tell people who are the Cato Institute people and uh, tell me specifically about your center and what you do there? Sure. Uh, Cato is the country's largest libertarian think tank. Uh, that is, we're, you know, we're politically independent. We, uh, we gore everybody's oxes. We're generally for limited government and individual liberty and free markets. Uh, my center, the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies, was uh, established, uh, what, over 20 years ago now, over 30 years ago now, um, uh, about a decade after Cato itself. Cato is now 43 years old. Uh, and uh, we publish papers. We file amicus briefs with the Supreme Court and other courts. Uh, we tweet, we blog, we write academic papers, we, we publish policy papers. And so my job, which I think is a, a lot of fun, is uh, straddling the legal, political, academic, and media worlds. Well, uh, one of the places I wanted to start was a set of statistics that you offered about SCOTUS nominations in general. We put those in on a chart. There have been 164 nominations to the court, including the current one right now. Uh, and of those, 126 were confirmed, 12 withdrawn, 12 rejected, three postponed, and 10 no action. And then, of course, the one that is currently in play with Judge Amy Coney Barrett. So uh, let me ask you overall on those 10 with no action. Uh, that's a flashpoint for the current nomination because of no action on Merrick Garland. Let's listen to the two leaders just before the president announced her nomination talking about the process, and then we'll come back and talk about it. The American people do not need any more revisionist history lectures, any more threats, or any more performance outrage from the side that launched this unfortunate fight and escalated it time after time after time. There is one right path before us. It does right by the judiciary, the Senate, the yet unnamed nominee, and the American people. It is a fair hearing, a fair process, and a fair vote. Here's how the Republican leader described the Senate role in confirming Supreme Court justices. He actually said, quote, we have an obligation under the Constitution to consider a Supreme Court justice should we choose to take advantage of it. Did you catch that? Did you catch that, Madam President? It's an obligation, but only if the Republican leader chooses to take advantage of it. So I see when there's a Democratic president, it's one of those obligations you don't have to take advantage of. Ilya Shapiro, you studied the history of uh, nominations. Who's got the history right on election year nominations? Huh. Well, you can argue it lots of different ways, and politicians being hypocrites on both sides is nothing new either. Um, you talked about a little bit of the statistics. To go more broadly, uh, which party controls the Senate and the White House is the whole ball game here. I mean, that's maybe uh, obvious, but it's a real difference historically. Uh, I'll get to election year in a, in a second, but overall, uh, counting all of those 163 nominations that we've had before Judge Barrett, uh, and if, if the same party controls the Senate and the White House, the confirmation rate's about 90%. If they're different party, it parties, it dips below 60. And that difference is even more accentuated in election year. For election year vacancies, of which this is the 30th, uh, 19 of them have been during united government, and 17 of the 19 have resulted in confirmations. 
Uh, one of the ones that didn't was a technicality with George Washington withdrawing and then resubmitting the nomination in the new Senate, and that got confirmed. Uh, and with divided government, only one of 10 uh, have gotten confirmed, and that was the last time that's happened, and that's in 18. 18- 88. So you can argue um, that it's, uh, you know, that's the major principle. And Mitch McConnell has been making that point. You can argue that that's a distinction without a difference. At the end of the day, these are political arguments. There's nothing in the law about it. Um, It's just saying, you know, making your case to voters that this is the kind of judge uh, we want and the people elected us or we're going to pass it or, um, you know, let the people have their say. Uh, At at the end of the day, um, these are political arguments that the voters will have to uh, ultimately weigh in on. During upcoming nomination hearings, uh, people will be hearing a certain number of phrases uh, regarding the nominee, and you referred to a couple of them, textualists and originalists. Are they synonyms for the same thing? Originalist uh, generally applies to constitutional interpretation and textualist to statutory. They're similar uh, beyond that, uh, uh, except that the the constitutional interpretation often takes part in a a greater historical time, uh, and so it's harder to get at what the uh, original public meaning, uh, as as the as the term is is used, of the of that text might might mean, and so we look at contemporary dictionaries and news accounts, how the language is used to understand what equal protection might mean or what interstate commerce might mean. Uh, for textualism, it's more modern statutes, so it's you know with the, the the language is is very similar to to what we use, if not exactly the same, and so it's more of a you know, trying to parse it together in in context. And uh, they may also hear questions about the phrase natural law uh, because it comes up with some recent uh, confirmation hearings. What does that concept mean? This came up a fair bit with uh, Clarence Thomas's confirmation hearing nearly 30 years ago. Uh, And it's the idea that there's an underlying uh, principle or substance uh, to the law. Um, Natural rights sometimes uh, uh, is invoked uh, as well. The rights that we have in nature before any uh, human government is formed that we, you know, the uh, we are uh, inalienable rights that are we are given by our creator in the words of the Declaration of Independence. And so the natural law is kind of the background uh, on which we legislate or on which the Constitution uh, exists that kind of kind of fill in the, 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 the gaps, if you will, uh, of the of the dry text. If confirmed, Judge Amy Coney Barrett would be the fifth female to serve on the Supreme Court, uh, but the sixth nominated. Harriet Myers earlier f- failed. What was the reason for that failure? She was um, considered not up to the job at the end of the day. Uh, she had some trouble in, in meetings with senators. Um, and then in the so-called murder boards, that's when uh, the nominees practice with White House and Justice Department officials for the confirmation hearings. And never having been an academic or a judge or a constitutional lawyer, she was a, in private practice and uh, uh, close to uh, George W. Bush, his personal lawyer, and then uh, his lawyer when he was the governor and then White House counsel. Uh, so was not did not have the, the same sort of background as uh, most modern uh, Supreme Court nominees do. And so at a certain point, uh, the Bush White House felt that she wasn't up to the job, and and um, and they pulled her. As you and I are talking this morning, Judge Barrett is beginning her one-on-one meetings with interested senators. And uh, in your book, you tell a number of stories about how important that personal quotient, the introduction to individual sen- senators, was for certain nominations. With a, such a divided Congress, do they still matter as much? Probably less, um, especially given that the Republicans seem to have the votes to confirm, unless something uh, comes out out of left field between now and the eventual vote. Um, so uh, maybe with the more moderate Democrats, if, if, if she can charm them, and, and she is very graceful and, and, and charming, so maybe that would give uh, you know, a little bit of bipartisan cover, perhaps. But at the end of the day, in this, in this period, this close to the election with, with how tensions are heightened, these meetings are probably less important than they've ever been. Judge Barrett is 48. How does that age put her in this, the uh, spectrum of appointees? Uh, right around the sweet spot. Of, uh, a little younger, I think, than the average. Um, uh, she, I think uh, Gorsuch was 49 when he was appointed, Kavanaugh 52. Uh, Thomas was 42, I think 43, when he, when he joined the court. Uh, so we have had uh, uh, younger people, but she's, you know, not exceedingly young, uh, but, you know, right, right around uh, the middle. It means that she could, of course, serve for you know, 30 years or, or more. And that's been a big change in the modern era. Before, about, 
about 1970, the average tenure was under 20 years. Uh, for those appointed since 1970, it's, uh, it's more than 25. Her law degree is from Notre Dame Law School. Every other sitting justice right now is a graduate of either Harvard or Yale Law School. When did that trend take place? Very recently. I mean, John Paul Stevens was Northwestern. Uh, O'Connor and Rehnquist were Stanford, which obviously also is an elite school. But um, this kind of professionalization or uh, you know, gold-plated credentialing uh, in the legal profession, uh, and this is, of course, the very pinnacle of the legal profession, is a fairly recent development. I mean, in, in earlier decades, um, you didn't necessarily travel far, especially to go to law school. If you wanted to practice in Chicago, you went to law school in, in Chicago, regardless of where you went to college, for that matter. And now, with kind of the, the law becoming nationalized and, uh, you know, elites uh, in, in all professions becoming nationalized, that there is uh, that kind of skew. And having gone to the University of Chicago Law School myself, I, I think that's a breath of fresh air to have someone with a Midwestern experience. And a couple other questions about logistics. The hearings, of course, this and this age will be televised live, streamed live on the internet, followed by social media, blogged about, covered in every possible way. Uh, when was the very first public confirmation hearing in our history? They weren't always. Right. Uh, for most of our history, we, we didn't have them. The very first one was 1916. Now, we don't have C-SPAN footage of that one, unfortunately, but it, I would contend that it's the most controversial one that we've had. People ask me, you know, which, which is the worst that we've had, uh, do I think, expecting me to choose among uh, Kavanaugh, Thomas, and Bork, typically. But Louis Brandeis in 1916, the first Jewish nominee, and probably even more controversially, was a uh, crusading social progressive uh, uh, reforming, uh, w wanting to reform all sorts of industries, um, civil rights, a whole host of areas that made him uh, politically very controversial when he was appointed in that presidential election year of 1916 by Woodrow Wilson. Now, at the time, again, it was so controversial that they had for the first time a public hearing, but it was seen as unseemly for the nominee himself to appear. So he did not. And that process ended up lasting nearly five months, the longest confirmation we've ever had. The, the ultimate voting margin was a little broader than some of the more contentious ones recently, um, uh, but it was just uh, very heated. And uh, even more, once he got on the bench, very soon after Charles Evans Hughes, one of his colleagues on the court, resigned to run against President Wilson in that fall's election. So if you thought 2020 or 2016 was politically contentious in terms of the interplay of the presidency and the court, 1916 will give it a run for its money. Well, the first time that a nominee appeared before the committee and testified, now it can be several days, but the first time was 1938. What was the circumstances? Uh, Felix Frankfurter um, was also happened to be Jewish. I don't think it was that, um, but it was just, uh, he was a, a Harvard professor and they, they wanted to question him uh, more broadly. Um, it didn't last very long. And, and indeed this kind of uh, what we're used to didn't really start up until the 60s, and then it didn't last the four days either. Byron White in 1962, his whole hearing was about an hour and a half at which uh, he himself testified for 15 minutes, largely about his storied football playing career, almost certainly, well, not almost, but definitely the, the last justice to have uh, played in the NFL while being a Yale law student, for that matter. But uh, uh, yeah, things, things have changed. The first televised hearing was Sandra Day O'Connor's in 1981. In your final section on reforms of the process, one of the things you suggest is no longer televising the hearings. Why do you suggest that? Yeah, that's perhaps an awkward uh, thing to touch upon in, in talking to C-SPAN, but I think um, the hearings were uh, a good development and, and broadcasting them was a good development. But at this point where everyone knows what's what's going to go on, it's at best kabuki and at, and at worst harmful to, to our public discourse in the sense that the nominee is coached and trained to talk a lot and not say anything. Justice Ginsburg uh, perhaps pioneered that method at, at her uh, hearings uh, in 1993. Um, and the uh, the senators, well, those that are uh, of the same party as the president are trying to lob softballs and make the nominee look good. And the opposing party is either trying to uh, have kind of harsh gotcha questions or just speechifying uh, to have a clip for their uh, election campaign advertisements. We don't learn very much about the nominee and we don't learn very much about the law and all of their 
paper trail, their, their judicial opinions, their academic writings, whatever else, is available to everyone online at the end of the day. So you could still have the closed hearing to discuss the uh, FBI background report, uh, sensitive financial records, those sorts of things that they already do in, in closed session. Uh, but the public hearing, I think, um, gets us all much more into the muck uh, and, and, and harms the process and the public more than it benefits. While we're talking about public access to the court, the court announced that uh, when it opens its session, the October hearings will be again on telephone and made available to the public as they happen, uh, which was uh, a, a COVID-driven innovation for the court. Are you a fan of uh, real-time streaming of court arguments? I like the audio, and I like the audio when they ask questions one after another rather than kind of the free-for-all where the lawyer barely has a chance to say a few words in response to a question before another one is asked. That also is a COVID innovation because they're using, a, I guess, a, a telephone conference call. This is not a Zoom. They're, 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 they've made it into the 20th century, not yet quite the, the 21st. Uh, and so they get to have uh, three, uh, about three minutes at a time. Each justice, in order of seniority, asks their questions, and the the uh, the, the advocate uh, responds. Um, and it's worked out. We've had uh, a couple of sittings that way in the spring. And the longer this goes, the more this norm is established that we're going to have the the live audio, it'll be hard, I think, to put the genie back in the bottle. Well, we shall see. Since you're talking to C-SPAN, you probably know what our position is on, on that question. Uh, during the presidential campaign, there are suggestions that a Biden presidency and a, a Barrett confirmation might lead to the expansion of the number of seats on the court. Uh, the number nine, is, as you tell in your history, is uh, not uh, set in stone. The court has been various sizes throughout history. How was the number nine uh, actually decided upon and when? Sure. We started with six. Uh, and then when John Adams lost his reelection bid to Thomas Jefferson, uh, there was a Midnight Judges Act, which uh, simultaneously gave Adams, more judges, more lower court judges uh, and, and magistrates to appoint, uh, and also cut back uh, at the next vacancy the seats on the court to five to prevent, uh, try to prevent Jefferson from getting a chance to, uh, to appoint the court. And by the way, in that lame duck session, uh, again, after Adams lost, that's when he nominated and had confirmed to the still capital F Federalist controlled Senate. Um, uh, John Marshall, the great chief justice, was a lame duck appointee of a losing presidential candidate. Um, so, again, very little new under the sun uh, in our history. After that, Thomas Jefferson, when the Democratic Republicans took charge, uh, re-expanded the court back up to six. Then we had the seventh and eighth seats uh, uh Sorry, the seventh seat later uh, added to try to Jefferson's attempt to uh, to counteract John Marshall's, again, capital F Federalist uh, sway on the court, really unsuccessful because Marshall was so convincing. And then the, the eighth and ninth seats were added uh, under Andrew Jackson, and they kind of led to Dred Scott. They solidified uh, a Jacksonian view of, of uh, uh, state federal relations on the slavery question, and that wasn't a good thing long term. Went up to 10 briefly under under Nixon. Uh, Congress tried to cut that back under Andrew Johnson, who, of course, was impeached but not removed. And then we solidified at nine in 1869. But it's an act of law. This is not something cast constitutional. All it would take would be a simple act of Congress signed by the president. Uh, the Senate would have to get rid of its filibuster first. That is, there's a Senate rule, again, not a law or a constitutional provision, but a Senate rule uh, that says you need 60 uh, Senate votes to proceed to a final vote on legislation. There is no more filibuster for judicial nominees. That was gotten rid of by the Democrats in 2013 for the lower courts and by the Republicans in 2017 for the Supreme Court. But if the Democrats win the Senate by enough of a margin and Joe Biden wins the White House, it does become a possibility that they could uh, remove the, um, the filibuster and then add however many seats they want. Although they should be cautious. The last time, you know, all the, the those 19th century uh, uh, occasions that I noted didn't really result benefit the country long term. And the last time something was tried was by FDR in 1937, when the Supreme Court, the nine old men, as they were called, were rejecting various New Deal programs. Roosevelt pr proposed to add an assistant justice. How helpful for all of the oldest uh, men, those over 70 and a half. Uh, that was hugely unpopular. His vice president campaigned against it. The chief justice and that progressive 
Justice Brandeis uh, were against it. Uh, and at the next midterm, even though FDR had just gotten reelected overwhelmingly, huge landslide in 1936. In 1938, uh, the Democrats lost 80 seats in the House and eight in the Senate. So be careful with that. I'm going to start with uh, with Dwight Eisenhower, uh, who had five appointments and most significantly put forward Earl Warren as the chief justice. He later called this the biggest damn fool mistake that I made. It's really important for this conversation to talk about the Warren court because much later appointments has been in reaction to what they did. So why was it the President Eisenhower's biggest damn fool mistake? Earl Warren was the Republican governor of California and had a you know, moderately Republican record there, uh, was a, a powerful figure in the party, uh, and uh, contributed to Eisenhower being selected as the presidential nominee. So it was a bit of a reward, as well as recognizing that this was a, an esteemed uh, Republican public official and lawyer and should be a good choice uh, for the court, especially to be chief justice, given the political skill required for, for that job. And ultimately, Warren uh, uh, was a, a progressive, a, a, a liberal on the court in a host of ways, uh, whether with regard to civil rights, of course, uh, it was his court that put in the unanimous, I mean, this was one of the less controversial, I think, in retrospect, parts of the Warren court, the, the Brown versus Board of Education and, and desegregation. There was a unanimous order, but uh, other things relating to criminal procedure and, and other areas that effectively spawned the, the modern conservative legal movement in, in response. And so Eisenhower, in seeing the direction that Warren took the court, I think, uh, was surprised and, uh, and disappointed. 1968 LBJ administration, uh, the Abe Fortas elevation to chief. You said this provided the inflection point to the modern era of court appointments. Tell me the story. Sure. Um, and in fact, it's the inflect one of the inflection points in my book. The first part is kind of the past until 1968. Second part is what I call the present, r really from, from Nixon, from that 1968 election through Kavanaugh. And then the third part is the future possible reforms, what we've learned. Um, before we get to Fortas and LBJ, though, I thought you were going to go next to the election year vacancy a month before the election in 1956 with Eisenhower, which he called uh, ultimately his second biggest uh, mistake on the court where he the Senate did not want to go back. They were out campaigning and he recess appointed uh, William Brennan and Brennan was not a, uh, a surprise or shouldn't have been because he was already a uh, a left-leaning justice on the New Jersey Supreme Court, but Eisenhower picked him for political reasons to shore up support in the metropolitan Northeast, especially uh, among Catholics. But, uh, uh, you know, th that was, that, that's come up a lot as well. Of course, it was a recess appointment, not a confirmation, uh, but uh, a month before the election and, and somewhat controversial, although later confirmed by the Democratic Senate. Uh, moving to 1968, right. So this is Warren again, announces his retirement uh, LBJ is the president embattled, you know, announces that because of Vietnam and his, his uh, dwindling popularity that he won't be running for re-election. Uh, but uh, he nominates Abe Fortas, then a sitting justice, uh, to elevate him to become chief justice. And Fortas runs into bipartisan opposition over various ethical concerns. Uh, now it might look like a small beer, but he had been paid to give a series of lectures, hadn't disclosed certain things. Uh, there were concerns. Some people call this the very first filibuster of a Supreme Court nominee or any judge, really. Uh, but Fortas never even got to that point. He never even had a majority of declared support in the Senate and certainly wasn't uh, wasn't uh, purely partisan opposition. So that nomination uh, goes nowhere. Uh, uh, Richard Nixon, the Republican, wins the election and ultimately gets to uh, replace Earl Warren with Warren Burger. And how did that selection work out for President Nixon? Well, Berger was, um, you know, Nixon, the, the language they used at the time was a little different. They didn't talk about uh, originalism and textualism. They talked about strict construction, which Justice Scalia would say was a misnomer. You don't want strict construction. You don't want narrow construction. You want reasonable construction of, of the text. But anyway, strict construction is what they talked about. Berger was kind of a moderate conservative, uh, although uh, too political on the court, really, and uh, was known for changing his votes to control the opinion, was known to be cagey in various ways, and both in terms of his uh, intellectual or jurisprudential output and in that management of the court uh, by modern historians is not given uh, uh, very high grades. 
Uh, another appointment that that Nixon made, you know, Nixon probably was moderately happy with with Berger, but another appointment uh, Nixon would 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 generally be disappointed in, and that's Harry Blackman, uh, who uh, ended up uh, authoring Roe v. Wade, among other. Uh, opinions and votes on the left that he would take. Uh, Blackman had been uh, childhood buddies with uh, Warren Burger. They, they, were, they were known as the Minnesota Twins, uh, but at the end of their lives, uh, Blackman didn't even go to uh, the funeral of, of Burger's wife. They had had such a falling out, mostly over these jurisprudential commitments. While you reference Roe v. Wade, it was a 7-2 to two decision in 1983, uh, and it's obvious to anyone listening to this that it becomes a central theme of every uh, Supreme Court nomination. Uh, why is it, what is it about that particular decision that has made it uh, continue to be argued so vociferously in the United States? Well, I agree with uh, Justice Ginsburg, actually, in her criticism of Roe v. Wade, that it was premature and uh, uh, cut off a political debate that was going in a certain direction uh, in the country, as well as doing it the wrong way, talking about kind of an amorphous privacy right somewhere in borrowing a previous uh, precedent, uh, the penumbras and emanations among various amendments, rather than what uh, Justice Ginsburg would have it uh, as kind of an equal protection, women's equality sort of justification. It's also different than other privacy cases in that uh, at a certain point, there's a second life in being that has uh, rights. Uh, That is unlike the contraceptive uh, cases that came before it or the uh, homosexual uh, sexual activity cases that came after it, this is not just consenting adults. At a certain point, and the law isn't very good at telling you where that point is, there is that that second human, whether that's at birth, conception, or any time uh, uh, in between. And it's, you know, the, the way that it short-circuited the political debate is unlike uh, the way that abortion debates have proceeded in any other Western democracy, where eventually there may have been court rulings, but the political process was allowed to work. And so, um, as you say, it's, it's, it's shaped and, and I would say poisoned our, our legal discourse ever since. Although curiously, uh, Roe v. Wade and the issue of abortion didn't play too large a role in the first couple of nominations after Roe came down. Roe was 1973. Two years later, President Ford nominated John Paul Stevens, uh, who was uh, a moderate Republican in his day, but sort of uh, uh, to the left uh, uh, jurisprudentially, but was not asked uh, about that case that had just been decided two years earlier. And Sandra Day O'Connor in her 1981 process, it didn't play uh, that large a role. So it was really it wasn't until uh, Bork in 1987 that, that Roe assumed the the, the huge uh, uh, role that it plays in, in all of our Supreme Court discussions. President Nixon also had uh, other important appointments, including Lewis Powell, which we write as the last appointment free of controversy. And he brought William Rehnquist uh, to the court. Uh, it, it was the first time that the ACLU opposed an appointment to the court. Why was his appointment controversial? There are a few reasons. Uh, Rehnquist was known as a law and order type when he was at the at the Justice Department. There were concerns about uh, statements he'd made in terms of uh, rolling back uh, certain uh, criminal procedure uh, rulings that the Warren Court had made. Uh, also, when he was clerking on the Supreme Court for Justice Robert Jackson, there were uh, memos that he wrote uh, about Brown v. Board, about other desegregation and civil rights issues, and there was some question about um, you know, was he on the wrong side of history on on issues like that? And then also uh, he was in the Justice Department, uh, uh, you know, which was uh, uh, getting to be politicized in the Nixon administration. This was before uh, Watergate. He didn't participate in the Saturday Night Massacre as Robert Bork did. Uh, but uh, uh, there, there was an, an affiliation there of, of sorts. And so um, definitely the most conservative appointment that Um, President Nixon made. And these same controversies would come back again when President Reagan elevated Bill Rehnquist to be Chief Justice in 1986. And by the way, that was the same time that Scalia was nominated by President Reagan. uh, And so Rehnquist drew away all the attacks. And that's part of the reason, but not all, of why Scalia ended up uh, being confirmed unanimously. Uh, I want to fast forward to Ronald Reagan, uh, but just a quick note about Jimmy Carter. One term president had no Supreme Court openings during his term, but you write that he did shape the federal judiciary. How? 
Uh, as sort of a consolation, as it turned out, Congress significantly expanded the lower courts, adding both circuit and district judgeships. And so uh, Carter was able to appoint more judges in one term. Uh, I'm blanking on the number. I think it's on the order of 269 uh, than any other uh, president, a record we're unlikely to see beat, including 59 circuit judges. Trump is close there. He's at 53. Um, so uh, uh, Carter was able to uh, transform certain circuits, certainly the Ninth Circuit. The reason the Ninth Circuit has a reputation for being uh, progressive or, or, or leaning left isn't geographic. It's not because California and Oregon are there because presidents of both parties have, uh, appoint federal judges to uh, sit in all states. It's that history. It's that uh, Carter got to fill about half of the uh, of the newly expanded court, and they've sort of stayed in the Democratic appointed family uh, ever since. And he, Carter's one of four presidents who never got to appoint a Supreme Court justice. Ronald Reagan, more than any other predecessor, made SCOTUS a campaign issue, seated half of the federal judiciary during his two terms in office. But I wanted to ask you about the importance of his attorney general, Edwin Meese, uh, to Edwin Meese, to the direction of the federal courts. Yeah. Um, Meese, who had uh, worked with Reagan when, when Reagan was the governor of California and was uh, had kind of previewed the judicial selection process that uh, he would take to the White House uh, in, in California, and that's to look at people who weren't simply loyal Republicans, say, uh, but, but look at what kind of um, intellectual or jurisprudential commitments they might have. And at the same time, uh, with Robert Bork and Scalia and other academics, this uh, originalism was a really uh, a burgeoning uh, area of uh, intellectual fervent. And so Mies gave a famous speech in 1985. Uh, this is now halfway through the Reagan's two terms. So it's a, it's a developing project, but talking about the need for uh, appointing originalists. At the time, it was original intent of the framers, and that's since been uh, refined because nobody really cares or knows what, say, James Madison had to say about violent video games, uh, but it's what the words on the page meant when they were enacted, whether that's in 1789 or in 1868 for the 14th Amendment and so forth. And so Mies played that very important role of linking the intellectual development to the sorts of judges that President Reagan and subsequent Republican presidents wanted to appoint. So in addition uh, to Antonin Scalia, Ronald Reagan also brought Anthony Kennedy and uh, Sandra Day O'Connor to the court and elevated uh, Justice Rehnquist to chief. But let's focus on that Robert Bork nomination in, in 1987. So heated that it ended up creating a verb for the future, I got borked. Uh, let's listen to an event that happened on the Senate floor just shortly after President Reagan announced the nomination, it is Senator Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts talking about the impact of Ju Judge Bork if he, in fact, was seated on the court. Robert Bork's America is a land in which women would be forced into back alley abortions. Blacks would sit at segregated lunch counters. Rogue police could break down citizens' doors in midnight raids. And school children could not be taught about evolution. Writers and artists would be censured at the whim of government. And the doors of the federal courts would be shut on the fingers of millions of citizens for whom the judiciary is and is often the only protector of the individual rights that are the heart of our democracy. Ended up with 12 days of hearings, five days of questionings for the, for the nominee himself, and a 42 to 58 Senate vote against his nomination. What happened during the Bork nomination? There were a number of things. So first of all, I think the Republican strategy, the White House strategy was flawed. They tried to portray Bork as neither a liberal nor a conservative, just uh, kind of calling them as he sees them, uh, much in the way of Lewis Powell, the, the, the moderate and the, the swing vote uh, at the time who, who Bork was uh, uh, nominated to replace. Uh, and uh, they were not ready, the Republicans, for the attack by Ted Kennedy and, and others, the uh, outside uh, activist groups. This was a fairly novel thing um, that got tremendous uh, media attention and uh, accentuated the attacks on Bork, um, kind of uh, a little bit of demagogic rhetoric. And you, you heard that Robert Bork's uh, uh, America speech, which, as you said, came less than an hour 
before the formal nomination was made. So the, the rapid response operations that we're used to now were not in place. Uh, and Bork himself uh, didn't do himself any favors, as Paul Simon, senator from Illinois on the Judiciary Committee, uh, would write uh, in his uh, in his book about the confirmation process, which uh, was significantly about about the Bork hearings, uh, Bork tried to score debaters points rather than picking up votes. And indeed, uh, Bork, who had been an academic for a long time, uh, gave these very dry, turgid lectures about points of law uh, and really was not um, endearing himself uh, uh, to to the committee, uh, regardless of what the the ultimate uh, merits of his legal opinions might be, and this was the first time that nominee that a nominee was rejected effectively for his um, judicial philosophy, um, uh, not simply that he wasn't qualified or ethical issues or came from the wrong part of the country. So, why did it become a tipping point? This the the media attention and the in the role of the outside groups uh, was a big deal. The idea that someone so eminently qualified and everybody agreed that he was uh, could be uh, rejected was came as a shock. Um, even after the Democrats had won the Senate in the '86 elections, and again, that's a, that's a key thing that happened between the Scalia Rehnquist confirmation in '86 and the Bork nomination in 87, even soon after that that uh, election, when Joe Biden was then uh, due to become the chairman in the of the Judiciary Committee in the new Senate, he had told the Reagan White House that if they nominate someone like Scalia or probably this guy Bork, uh, that that things would be OK. And if the outside groups criticize me, this is Biden's talking, I'll just have to deal with it. Well, uh, a year later, Biden was running for president already, and he had heard an earful from these outside groups. And so as chairman and under the uh, attacking leadership of, of uh, Senator Kennedy, um, uh, you know, they needed to uh, they needed to, to get a scalp, uh, if you will, and, and oppose uh, this direction on the court. Interestingly, before we got Anthony Kennedy as the eventual confirmed nominee for that seat, we also had Douglas Ginsburg, who was announced by President Reagan. But before his name was even officially submitted to the Senate, he withdrew because it came out that he had smoked marijuana with his with his students at Harvard Law School. I consider him to be the last public casualty of the drug war. I can't think of another public official whose career was harmed by uh, uh, it coming out that he had uh, smoked marijuana. So on to the George H.W. Uh, Bush administration. And we have about 20 minutes left in our conversation. So I have to fast forward through some interesting <laughs> modern history here. Uh, a, a, a quick word about David Souter, his appointment. You write that it, that his appointment became an object lesson for future presidents. Why is that? Well, stealth nominees are, are hard, are a hard thing. Um, the Republicans basically overreacted after Bork. They, they, they saw what happened there with someone who had a long track record of uh, potentially controversial or at least uh, twistable uh, positions. And so they wanted someone who would be a, a you know, a, a good conservative on the court, but without that kind of track record. And uh, being vouched for by John Sununu, the, the chief of staff, who was from New Hampshire, and Warren Rudman, the senator from, from New Hampshire, uh, they, they pushed uh, David Souter, who had been attorney general in that state and briefly on the Supreme Court of that state before uh, Reagan tapped him for the First Circuit and then eventually picked him over someone with a much more visible uh, conservative record, Edith Jones, who to this day uh, is on the Fifth Circuit. She was appointed to the Fifth Circuit by President Reagan when she was 35, I believe. Uh, it would have been a diff very different court had uh, had uh, the George H.W. Bush gone with Edith Jones rather than David Souter. And on the Clarence Thomas nomination, I'm sure everyone listening to us uh, has uh, memories of uh, what happened during there. And, of course, we're noting that uh, the current Democratic presidential nominee was the chair of the Judiciary Committee during the hearing, so we will likely be hearing more about this in the weeks ahead. But you write of the nomination, he was the right nominee at the wrong time, and it was the greatest shift in jurisprudence in the court's history. So uh, what do you think the lessons are of the Clarence Thomas nomination? Well, we do have the most um, contentious confirmation processes when big shifts are possible. So Thomas was nominated to replace Thurgood Marshall, uh, the most uh, uh, progressive, you know, left side of the court, obviously the first uh, African-American on the court. And here was Clarence Thomas, even though he was also African-American, was uh, then and still is the, the most conservative member 
uh, of the court. Uh, that shift is probably even bigger than the one that we'll see if uh, Judge Barrett uh, replaces Justice Ginsburg. But a similar shift, and that goes also into why right now we're living in such a, a controversial moment. Um, but Thomas was young as well. Uh, he was, I think, 42 or 43 by the time he joined the court. Um, and, you know, is on the court nearly 30 years later, could still serve. He's in his early uh, 70s for a while yet. So this was definitely a, uh, a as we talked about inflection points, that this was uh, an indication of the shift on the court. George uh, Bush brought uh, jo uh, John Roberts and Samuel Alito to the court. Uh, John Roberts uh, quickly moved on to become chief on the passing of William Rehnquist, uh, most remembered by conservatives for his vote on the Obamacare ruling. Uh, but you write that he's the first chief justice to be a median vote in, in a half century. So what has his tenure life been so far? Right. Well, he's only been the median vote for a couple of years since uh, Justice Kavanaugh replaced Justice Kennedy. Uh, and I do mean median, not swing. I think he, he plays a, a different role and goes about his task differently than Kennedy did, who truly was a moderate and could go different ways on different areas of law or different types of cases. Roberts uh, is, is, is a conservative. It's, it's hard to deny that, that he's a conservative. I don't think he's sh shifted left uh, either, like some others have uh, since joining the court, but he's more of an institutionalist uh, or a minimalist. That is, he doesn't want the court to move in big steps, doesn't want it to get uh, too far ahead of public opinion, and in fact wants to defer to the political process as much as possible, cares about those sorts of things and judicial restraint, not acting boldly much more than things like originalism or textualism or any other uh, overarching theory. And so we've seen, particularly in these last two years, when he is definitively in the middle of the court jurisprudentially, not just physically as the chief justice, uh, that some of his votes are kind of head scratchers based on his past record. The abortion case this past term, that Obamacare case uh, eight years ago when even the moderate Kennedy was ready to throw out the entire law. And uh, Roberts has been acting in a way that, uh, to his mind, and you know, we can debate how successful he's been or whether he's calculating correctly, in a way to try to preserve the court's institutional reputation or, uh, or legitimacy. All throughout your book, you uh, talk about the varying standards that individual presidents brought to their Supreme Court selections. When we move to President Barack Obama, what were his standards for choosing his two justices? It's a little different for Democratic presidents than for Republican ones, although the the the, the set of appointments is, is much lower in modern times as well. We've only had four Supreme Court nominations by Democratic presidents in the last 50 years. Uh, what Obama wanted was uh, definitely someone on the progressive side. It's, it's hard to err there for uh, Democratic presidents because the legal profession is generally to the to the left, uh, especially at, at its uh, elite uh, academic uh, levels. Uh, and he wanted uh, representational picks. I think he wanted to have more women on the court. Uh, I think uh, a big reason why Sonia Sotomayor was his first pick is because he wanted a, uh, a, a Hispanic voice uh, on the court as well, uh, all other things being equal, uh, or even, even even all other things being slightly unequal. Uh, and so, um, yeah, he appointed uh, Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan, who was the uh, at the time the only non, uh, and still remains, the only non-judge or someone who would not have judicial experience. She was Solicitor General. Um, and uh, both of them have uh, continued to be uh, fairly reliable votes on the on the left side of the court, with, with Kagan also being kind of cagey and more political and putting together coalitions in the middle with uh, John Roberts. So moving on uh, to President Trump's nominees to the court, first appointment, Neil Gorsuch, uh, party line vote in judiciary, but a few Democrats crossed over for his nomination. When you watched the confirmation process he went through, how does it fit in the context of what we've been talking about? Well, it's, it's hard to separate the Gorsuch nomination itself from what happened the year before when Justice Scalia died in February 2016. Um, there hadn't been an election year vacancy since 1968, the, that Abe Fortas elevation, uh, which, as, as I dated, is before the, the true modern era. Um, and so there were these arguments about whether the Senate had a duty to act and all of this sort of thing. And, of course, uh, Merrick Garland was nominated uh, the Republicans did not attack Garland. They kept saying that simply 
because uh, Obama had won and then the Republicans won the Senate the following election, there should be a rubber match for the people to uh, to, 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 to decide uh, who should be making that that pick. And it was a gamble that that ultimately Mitch McConnell won a risky one, I think. More people expected uh, Trump to lose, certainly, and Hillary Clinton could have nominated someone uh, less moderate than uh, than Garland. But anyway, uh, out of that bad blood uh, and the unusual nature of Donald Trump's candidacy, uh, the resistance to his presidency that that's ongoing to this day, uh, you had the Garland nomination, the first ever partisan filibuster of a Supreme Court nominee. Um, uh, Chuck Schumer, then as now the Democratic Senate leader, probably knew uh, that this would mean ultimately that the filibuster would be gone and that he'd have much less leverage over the future, presumably Kennedy replacing uh, nomination, let alone Ginsburg, um, but uh, felt he had no choice. Demonstrations outside his brownstone in Brooklyn, uh, the base was, uh, you know, wanted uh, wanted blood. And so ultimately Mitch McConnell, the Republicans uh, voted to eliminate the filibuster uh, and, uh, and Gorsuch was confirmed. I mean, recall, Thomas was confirmed 52-48. Alito was confirmed 58-42. They could have been filibustered. There was an attempt to filibuster Alito for that matter in uh, in 2005, uh, joined by about half the Democrats, including Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Chuck Schumer, basically the more politically uh, activist uh, or, or looking towards their own political future in, in primaries, uh, senators. So, uh, But it had never gotten to the point of an actual filibuster blocking a final vote until Gorsuch. And so he got through on that party line except for three uh, votes. Uh, and um, uh, you know, a year later, uh, it came time for, for Kavanaugh. And uh, let's play a clip from the Judiciary Committee hearing uh, that uh, just shows the theme overall between the two parties as they approach the Brett Kavanaugh nomination. This is Dick Durbin and Lindsey Graham. I, I welcome whatever the committee wants to do because I'm telling the truth. I want to know what you want to do. I, I'm telling the truth. I want to know what you want to do, Judge. I'm innocent. I'm innocent of this charge. And you're prepared for an FBI investigation? They don't reach conclusions. You reach the conclusions, No, Senator. but they do investigate questions. Please. If there is no truth to her charges, the FBI investigation will show that. Are you afraid that they might not? Oh, come on. Hey. Gee whiz. This is not a job interview. Yeah. This is hell. This, this, this is going to destroy the ability of good people to come forward because of this crap. To my Republican colleagues, if you vote no, you're legitimizing the most despicable thing I have seen in my time in politics. Well, nominees are still coming forward uh, and the process is still happening. So what it really has been the outcome of the Kavanaugh nomination? A further poisoning of the well uh, between the parties, between supporters uh, of the parties. Um, I think the... Uh, the Kavanaugh experience, um, like the putting together of the list of potential nominees by Donald Trump in 2016, uh, forged together the Republican coalition uh, further. Um, and a lot of people who might perhaps uh, not have wanted to push for a nomination this time around um, uh, because of what they feel is the unfair treatment that Kavanaugh had uh, they're they're going along with that now, but it was a it was a further escalation and a further uh, ratcheting up of tensions in this uh, modern tit for tat um, of uh, regarding confirmation battles. Your book Supreme Disorder closes, as you referenced, with some prescriptions for what ails the process and the court. Uh, what's really practical? Uh, what kind of uh, solutions can the country really approach that that are really achievable? Well, those that are practical uh, wouldn't do that much, and those that would do something are really uh, impractical. I, I think there's, or, or too politicized, uh, and so wouldn't uh, achieve the goal of depoliticizing the, the process or the court. Um, term limits is, is talked about a lot, uh, and there's, there's been some more chatter recently uh, because you know, we want to avoid, ideally, these morbid health watches over octogenarian justices or politically timed retirements. Um, I had an op-ed in the Atlantic last week, and Steve Calabresi, who wrote the seminal article with Jim Lindgren of Northwestern Law School on term limits about 15 years ago, he had an op-ed in the New York Times proposing an 18-year limit, a uh, new vacancy every two years, and so people would know when they're electing a president or voting for senators that that's very much directly going to affect 
the confirmation process. Um, I think that would help public confidence in certain ways, but it's not a panacea because it wouldn't change the court's ideological balance. It wouldn't change the power the court has and therefore the importance uh, of those seats, even if they're only for 18 years rather than 30 plus. Plus, it would take a constitutional amendment. So if we had the unity of uh, will to achieve that, then maybe there would be less underlying tensions in the first place. Other proposals, whether in terms of packing the court, uh, expanding the number, uh, restructuring it in other ways, maybe cycling through lower court judges rather than having permanent justices. Uh, I mean, um, they're very political. They're, they're, they either are impractical or uh, it would be seen as, as so political that it would only continue the cycle of, of partisan uh, retributions. Uh, at the end of the day, a lot of these reform proposals are really rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic because the Titanic is not uh, the process. It's the ship of state. It's the product of a court that has to rule on these national controversies in a large and diverse society. Uh, if we have centralized government power uh, with the court ruling on uh, all the big issues rather than having Congress resolving them, rather than having state legislatures uh, resolving them, then there's, uh, given the uh, separation of interpretive theories that map onto partisan preferences, there's no way to avoid uh, these big fights. And so just as it took decades for us to get to where we are, I think any change will come, uh, you know, not soon, but but more would have to be more gradual. And as another thing that your book really demonstrates, a, a, a nominee appointed to the court could be very different over the course of his or her tenure, always affecting then sure. the outcome of the of the decisions. Yeah, I mean, presidents, what they have in mind is either the next election or a particular issue. Uh, say, executive power in wartime for George W. Bush. Uh, but who knows what the governing issues or what the real controversies are going to be in 20 years and how they arise. So it's uh, certainly, even if you don't, uh, you know, so-called misfire uh, with, uh, you know, a David Souter or a, a John Paul Stevens or, 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 or a Earl Warren, uh, there still is a lot of uh, unpredictability in this business. Well, as a new term opens for the Supreme Court and a confirmation process is underway, I want to thank you very much, Ilya Shapira, for joining us to talk about your new book, Supreme Disorder. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. And uh, if viewers go to supremedisorder.com, not only can they buy the book, that's sure, but you can also download a statistical and historical appendix uh, to really dive down and nerd out on uh, all of these nominations. Well, thanks again. Nice to see you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.